In this part of the French and Ever So Feud, we will get into the conflict that starts with the controversial death of Silas Gayhart, the first shootout in Hazard, Kentucky, then a ceasefire that falls apart when Joseph Everso gets into a deadly scuffle with Bill Gambrill. The most favored tactic among feudists of the mountains was an ambush. With the lush and deeply wooded areas, it was very easy to remain unseen. Both sides had hired armed men. These were no ordinary run-of-the-mill men. They were highly skilled hunters and mountain men. Many of them had served during the Civil War, so they knew military tactics as well. All of this would come to play in this feud as it began to turn deadly. All aboard the Kentucky Tennessee Living Time Machine! Please fasten your seat belts and keep your arms and legs inside of the vehicle at all times. But to get going, we need your help. We still need to fire up the time machine to transport us. Please help us by clicking on the like, subscribe, and bell notification buttons down below. Not only does this fire up our time machine, but it convinces YouTube that we need a bigger time machine to reach more people who love history as much as you do. Now, back to our story. Silas Gayhart the very first death in the French Eversole feud is somewhat disputed. In the book, Kentucky's Famous Feuds and Tragedies, it is claimed that over a dozen men ambushed and killed Silas Gayhart. Silas was a friend to Gayhart and part of his hired hands. The French faction claimed that Eversole and his faction had killed Gayhart. The Eversole faction denied this and claimed that Gayhart died because of another dispute that he had going on at the same time. Also, according to the book, quote, it has been stated and contended that killing of Gay Hart was an affair entirely disconnected with the French Everso controversy, that the man had fallen the victim of a quarrel he had with persons not members of the clan. This may be true, and it may not. It is difficult in such social upheavals to get an unvarnished truth. When crimes are committed under the cover of Black Knight, from well-secreted places, suspicion might point in the wrong direction and accuse the innocent. For this reason, it is best to abstain from the charges not definitely established beyond any sort of doubt. The result of the Gayhart murder, however, was the same as if he had been publicly assassinated by the Everso clan, for the French believed that Gayhart lost his life because of his friendship for him." Unquote. Whether or not the Everso faction did the crime or not, it would be the moment that the French faction would take up arms and declare war. From this moment forward, there was no turning back. The First Shootout The same source talks about the first shootout in Hazard, Kentucky a short time later. French had left Hazard during the winter of 1886-1877 to, to find more hired men. Musenberg writes in his book, quote, Many theories are advanced in the explanation of this singular action. Some attributed it to fear. Those better acquainted with the temper and makeup of the French clan scouted the idea and suggested that French was seeking reinforcement in the country and that at an opportune moment he would sweep down upon the village, trap the hemmed in Eversoles, and annihilate them with overwhelming forces." Unquote. Everso had discovered that French and his men had evacuated Hazard, and so Everso withdrew his men to a part of the country where his sympathizers were located, except for a couple of them he left in town. He used these men as bait should the French faction return. Everso had planned to do an attack of his own when French and his recruits had returned to town. In his thinking, if French should discover the small troop of men and choose to sweep in and overtake them, then Everso could attack him from the rear and overtake their position. Neither side was fooled by the other one's tactical maneuvers. Musenberg again writes in his book, quote, Everso scouted everywhere, frequently on the trail of French. During the month of June and the dark of night, the latter re-entered Hazard took position of his fortified places where most of his men remained secreted, while the more daring of them walked the streets the next morning, bantering the Eversoles that had been left in town. 
their leader was once notified by messenger to the country of the state of affairs. He had put in a few men with them at that time, but these started for town. Seven or eight men, fortunately for him, joined his ranks on the way. It was late in the day when hazard was reached, but the lateness of the hour did not defer attack. From well-selected positions, the ever so opened a plunging fire upon the housed-up Frenchmen. These replied to the fuselage with equal spirit. Hundreds of shots were fired with great expenditure of ammunition and without appreciable result. Only one man was seriously wounded on the side of French. No casualties were admitted by the Eversoles. The darkness of the night brought the engagement to a close. French withdrew from town." Unquote. A Short Peace Agreement Throughout the summer of 1877, the forces would meet, would fire upon each other, then withdrew. This went on during the summer months with no clear victor. Both French and Eversole almost went bankrupt from paying the men to fight that summer as their businesses began to fail. There was a huge expense paid by each of the sides to keep the standing army ready. Musenberg writes in his book, quote, So when the friends of both sides interceded, French and Eversole seemed to be willing to appoint and send representatives to a conference, which was held on Big Creek in Perry County. It was attended by prominent citizens of both Perry and Leslie counties, who were anxious to bring about a settlement of the war, unquote. Both sides sent representatives to the meeting at Big Creek in Perry County, and the written agreements were signed and witnessed. The agreement basically stated that both sides would disarm by surrendering their guns and ammunition, disband their armies, and go home. French surrendered his guns to the county judge of Leslie County, while Eversole surrendered his guns to his father-in-law, Judge Josiah Combs of Perry County. Both sides disbanded. There were many on both sides of this conflict that said that the peace accord was nothing more than a piece of paper and that it was worthless. There was no feelings of friendship on either side. The reasons behind the peace accord was for purely financial reasons. Respect for the law, welfare of the country, and the people living in the area took a back seat to those that were involved in the feud. Also the thought that the feelings of distrust and rancor was still among those who participated in the feud, and so it was like a kettle on a stove ready to boil over. The peace accord fell apart pretty quickly as neither of the men were willing to let their grudges against the other go. French accused Eversole of taking his guns back from his father-in-law, Judge Josiah Combs. Eversole justified his claim that French had not witnessed that happening and was basically calling him a liar. Everso further claimed that French had not disbanded his army and that the deal had only called for a partial surrender of arms. Musenberg writes in his book, quote, Whether or not these reports had been actually brought to the ears of the chieftains or had been invented by them in order to manufacture some sort of pretext upon which to renew hostilities must ever remain in doubt. Future events seem to prove rather clearly that neither of the parties was in very good faith toward keeping the peace. Both French and Eversole appeared singularly well prepared to re-enter the war. The ink had hardly dried on the treaty when Perry County was once again thrown into turmoil and strife. What had the authorities been doing during this period of quasi-warfare? We find absolutely no record of any sort of attempt to maintain the dignity of the law, unquote. So now the question becomes, was this peace accord made with good faith after all? Or was this a way to recover from the financial burden that both men were facing because of the hired hands? Whatever the reason may be, we have to agree with Mosenberg that it was not done with the best of intentions. Joseph Eversole versus Bill Gambriel. A heated argument broke out in Hazard, Kentucky between Joseph Eversole and Bill Gambriel on September 15, 1887. We get the description of Gambriel and Eversole from Musenberg's writings. Quote, Gambriel was a minister of the gospel, a typical mountaineer, tall, powerful, and game. He would fight at the drop of a hat and drop the hat himself. It was said of him that he considered moonshine whiskey of much benefit for the stomach. 
and a game of cards and agreeable diversion from the cares and toils of life. It was said of him, too, that he carried a testament in one pocket, a deck of cards, a bottle of liquor, and a pistol in the other. This had been told as in a joke, but straightway this description of him was accepted as fact and was widely published in the papers at the time, unquote. The truth of the matter is that he was a man who entertained rather singular, independent, and free ideas of the duties of preacher. He was a good man, and he had a wide circle of friends. Joe Everso was physically a small man of slight stature, but quick and agile as a boy. Certainly, he was fearless, unquote. There is an old saying in the mountains that mountain men are either preachers or horse thieves. This is to mean that there are two types of hardy men of the mountains, those that are gentle and church-going and those that love to raise a ruckus. By the sound of it, Bill Gambriel was a little of both. We get a pretty interesting picture of how the fight ended for Musenberg. Hang on to your hat because it gets pretty descriptive. Quote, After a short exchange of blows between the men, Gambriel was fired upon by secreted friends of Everso. Attempting to escape by running around the house, Gambriel was fired upon from another quarter and fatally wounded. Staggering and reeling, he turned upon Everso, who fired into his head, instantly killing him, unquote. Was the shooting of Gambriel fair and on the up and up? That would be a question that would not only see the inside of a courtroom, but would also be put into a report for the governor of the state of Kentucky. We will let you decide if justice was served or if it was denied in this case. Several men would be indicted for murder of Bill Gambriel, but only one man was tried in a court of law. The first trial had a hung jury and the second trial acquitted him. The open secret of Hazard at that time was that the man who shot him and gave him the fatal wound was a police officer. Even though Joseph Eversole was the man who killed Gambriel by shooting him in the head, he had not been arrested or faced charges because there was a witness that said that Gambriel attacked him first. There was an official report made to the governor of the state of Kentucky regarding this fight. In the report, it states that Eversole had started the fight and killed Gambriel. According to another source, French and his faction insisted that Eversole be charged for the shooting and murder of Gambriel. Eversole's forces insisted that Gambriel pulled out a gun and that Eversole was shooting back at Gambriel in self-defense. Judge Combs refused to issue a warrant out for the arrest of Eversole on those grounds. Call us a little skeptical here. What was the argument over between Eversole and Gambriel? Why did the men shoot at Bill Gambriel? Was he winning the scuffle between him and Eversole? While Gambriel was trying to get away, why did Everso feel that he needed to kill him? Why was Everso never charged for murder? Was it because Judge Combs was his father-in-law? Why was a second man charged for killing Bill Gambriel instead of Everso, and who was he? The killing of Gambriel left a sour taste in everyone's mouths because Gambriel was a very well-liked traveling preacher who had many friends. French took his death very hard because they were great friends and Gambriel had been such a staunch supporter for his factions. Even the Eversoles knew that his death would not go unanswered and they were taking every precaution to protect themselves. For now, we will leave the French Eversole feud with the death of Gambriel. The Eversole faction had successfully made their way through the court system and was acquitted of all the charges. The French side was very angry by the death and was now starting to plan. We will pick up next week with the winter ceasefire and the murder of Joseph Everso. Thank you. We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for watching our video series on the Appalachian Feuds. Don't forget to hit that like button as the more likes we receive the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notice when we upload a new video, be sure to subscribe and click the bell notifications. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we are discovering the mysteries of Appalachian history.